Hi everyone, my name is Leandro. As he said, I work with Elixir and Erlang, a little bit of Elm as well in, uh, in Telios. Um, that's in the energy industry, but I also have a YouTube channel, as our friend here mentioned. So uh, this is going to be a very, all the talks so far have been super technical. This is not a technical one, so you can more lightheartedly feel it's quick, also only 20 minutes. So this is uh, this just three parts. The, the first one is more getting people interested in Elixir. Then it's um, that some of the downfalls and difficulties you might find when people are learning Elixir or functional programming for the, fir for the first time. And then how do we make them learn on their own, right? How do we, we make them walk on their own legs? So that's the, um, that's the basic idea. So part one, the first five seconds. Now, who watches YouTube here, Every, everyone? <laughs> YouTube, yeah, OK. So there's this, um, there's this rule in YouTube, this, like in a statistic, that we choose which video we're going to see. Like, we choose if, if we're going to see the video in the first five seconds of the video. So you click on the video, right? And if it sucks, you just close. That's, that's 2018, right? You don't have to. It's not TV. So there's this. And this is something I learned on my, my channel, but it's, it's, it's true. I also do this personally. So when, when we're getting to a new technology, we kind of have a bigger problem before we even have the problem of teaching people the language is that they need to be interested. They need to want to learn. And so when people hear Elixir for the first time or they, they're introduced to it, they're kind of like, oh, do I want to do this, right? Do I? I'm not sure. So how do we do that? Do we use marketing? How do, we, how do we do that? How do we sell? And the thing about marketing is that nowadays you can only do proper marketing or sell something if the product is good, which is fortunate for us because Elixir, who thinks Elixir is awesome here? <laughs> so we have a point in our favor here, okay? So it's generally awesome. It's not that, like you're trying to sell something fake. Like you're just, hey, this is really awesome, okay? But let's see how it usually goes, right? People head to Elixir page, and I'm like looking at this, okay, I don't really have time, let me just scan this quickly, right? And I see these key words here, dynamic, functional, scalable, maintainable, Erlang VM, low latency. I don't know, I'm bored, you know? Mm. There's, there's one issue also. Some people don't have concurrent problems. Some people just have boring problems. They just want to build a website or they, I don't know, just want to parse some CSVs, you know, some stuff like that. And so when we read this thing here, it sounds like NASA, you know, oh my God, how am I gonna? And so I, I think this is a little bit problematic. This is what I usually try instead. Phoenix. Let's see Phoenix website. And you enter Phoenix and you're like, Productive, reliable, fast, like God. Yeah, this sounds good. And then you see here, APIs, HTML apps. Like, this tells me everything I wanted to know as a web developer, so I like this. And it starts as a productive web framework, so productivity. Like, that's basically a problem everyone has. Everyone wanna be productive, right? Like, I wanna be productive, so that's, that's good. I think that's a good, a good selling point. So, if we head over to my YouTube channel, my most watched video is the <laughs> Hello World video, and it's a bad video. This is like the first video I've ever done. It's, it's horrible. If you want to see me embarrassed, you just go watch it, and you're going to laugh a lot. But the point is, this ties up with what I was saying before. People want to be productive, and tied into that is that they want to start now. They want to start quickly. How do I get started with this? real quickly. So that's, that's why I get this. It's not because it's me or because I'm super smart. It's just that people go to YouTube and say, Elixir, hello world. That's what they do. So the other thing is quick start. So the points here to get people interested um, that I find effective are we show them it's productive. It's not only super awesome in concurrence, which, you know, if you know what's up or if you heard of anything like that, you already know. But when you show them it's productive, you can actually solve your problems with this. 
that's really good. And the other thing is, how do I quick start this? And this is also a place where we win because it is super fast and super awesome to start things in Elixir. You just create a new Phoenix app and you have a website, right? It's like seconds. It's super, super cool. Okay. Victory. Now we head over for part two. So let's assume now that our friend, she or he is like, okay, okay, this is okay. I'm gonna take a look at this. So, um, let's head over to a different direction here. Who's here as a parent, father, mother? Okay, and how easy it was for your newborn to breastfeed? Yeah, yeah, so when new with newborns, you know, the kid is born and so she needs to feed. But the thing is she doesn't know how to do it, right? And she needs to eat and it's so hard. It tries once, it tries twice and it's, ah. So eventually it learns, right? And otherwise it doesn't go on. But so the thing is learning anything new, anything new is really hard, right? So um, this is something that we kind of have to remind ourselves, especially if it has been a long time since we first learned our first functional language or we first learned Elixir, is that when people are doing this for the first time, it's just gonna be. I like this chart here, just something a little bit different. So this is <laughs> axis of confidence and the axis of skill. And this is what happens, right? Generally, you start using something and you're like, oh, this is awesome. This is awesome. I feel great. Oh, amazing. And then your test fail, and then your build fails, and then you don't know how to fix your problems, and then, oh, you just plummet down a rock bottom. And we call this valley of despair. And typically, now is where your learner is, or she. They're like, don't understand me. What, 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 you don't have four while loops? What is atoms? I don't get it, right? So they're gonna be in this place where everything is very confusing. So, it might even be that they're asking strange questions. Because when we don't know the context of something, when, when we're learning something that has so many new concepts, sometimes you can't even formulate your questions prob uh, bleh, properly, right? You're gonna ask questions that maybe don't make sense, right? So you, let's say you have a flat tire, and you ask me, hey, where's the hammer? I say, hey, okay, the hammer is there. And you go, okay, and then I try to get the hammer and fix my flat tire, and you're like, what? What are you talking about? So maybe the questions that people are asked are not gonna make sense. And this brings us to something called the XY problem, which is when people ask you something to solve something else. And this happens especially, like let's say the person did a lot of object orientation before, so they're gonna ask you, I don't know, how do you do multiple inheritance in Elixir? It's like, no, that's, that's not the right question, right? So, um, how, do we, how do we deal with this? Because this, this, this happens. So, a lot of people fall off the track here, right? So people just get to this place, they're like, you know what, I'm just, whatever, I'm just not gonna use this anymore. But for the, the community or the, the people who are teaching it, who are, uh, yeah, teaching Elixir, there's really empathy and patience because you have to remember, like I said, the more experience you have, the more it becomes difficult to relate to the people who are just starting and have this so much uh, doubts. And especially if it's the first programming language, first uh, functional programming language, or if it's uh, Elixir. And also patience because of these things. Sometimes they're gonna be asking things that it don't even, don't even make sense. And you have to try to, well, okay, let's understand what, what is the context, what is the problem that you're trying to solve? Like, can you, can you send me some code sample? Can you try to run this, right? And from the part of the pupil, the person who is learning, what works best for me is just building things. Like, you have to code, you have to, the only way out is through, right? You have to just program and really have the experience to, to to pass through this. And sometimes in this phase, even books are not gonna help that much if you don't, if you, if you only read them and you, you're not really programming. 
So, it's like the, an effect freeze. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. Elixir is not a language, it's an experience. So we, we're going to, um, you know, you're going to have doubts and then you enter the Slack or the IRC or the Telegram and then you're going to see some of the faces that you see here, they're going to be there. And so it's not only about the language. There's a lot of languages there, good languages that no one uses, right? And Elixir is not like that. And this was great for me when I started. Like everyone, there was a lot of help. There was a, th th this is great, right? I'm not criticizing. It's more like this is great and we have to keep it like this and this is critical for people who are coming in. And as Elixir grows, it is important, I think, to keep this in mind, right? It is an entire experience of things. I think I'm going too fast. <laughs> Part three. Okay, so our people now has survived, right? Now, when someone has begun to learn and begin to understand things and, and they, they are able to deal with the ecosystem, they're able to ask their questions. The final goal that we want is, or more the question that we want to ask, how do, how do we get them to be independent? How do we get them to ask the right questions? How do we get them to read things and understand? How do we get them to a place where they can actually understand things on their own, right? So we'll get back to our newborn again, just once more. Our newborn has now learned um, how to breastfeed and before it gets to be this great person in its life, it has to learn these things, right? It has to learn how to walk, it has to learn how to breathe, it has to learn how to get heat, it has to learn how to make sense of, of light in the, in the eye. And these are all basic skills, right? These are all like the basic things before you can get ahead. There's the sentence here by this guy, Randy Posh. Get the fundamentals down, otherwise the fancy stuff isn't going to work. It's from the last lecture. And I couldn't have put better myself. And I think ultimately this is what it comes down to, is getting people to, to learn the very fundamental part of Elixir. So, where is that? Where, where do people usually struggle, right? And in my experience, it has been that it isn't the things that are different from their background. So a lot of people come from Ruby, for instance. So I, I came from Java or from JavaScript. And the difference between object orientation and functional programming there is gigantic. And that is usually where they struggle. And for Elixir specifically, there are some things from functional programming that we don't have, like, I don't know, currying. Uh, has things that Haskell people tell me that I don't even understand, like union types or whatever. You know, we don't have all of that, but, but we, we do have some things. So I will share what my videos like have been sought more and what I see are like the, the like important things. One of them is uh, immutability. Like if you come from object orientation, this is just like, it's getting better, I guess, but it's from in Java, this is, ah, it's just objects everywhere and you mutate them and it's, so you have to understand that in Elixir everything is immutable and how does, how does like variable rebinding works, all those process. That is one thing that I find very important. Following from that, pattern matching. This is actually my second most watched video, pattern match. It, it, it just sounds so basic, but the fact is, it's critical to understand this. Like for instance, when you have functions, like different function heads, right? If the person doesn't understand pattern matching, it's not gonna understand how it's possible that you have multiple functions and then and you're putting like strings in the argument. It's like, what is this? Like, right, so how do you, you do this and how it works in relation to the other things? Next up is recursion. We don't have while we don't have four loops. Well, we have four, but it's, it's different. Right? It's, it's like a generate. It's not the, the regular four. So how does, how does recursion work and, and how do we use them in, in, in Elixir? Can't really understand a lot of things if you don't, if you don't get it, right? And someone who is Fred, uh, they were mentioning Fred Hebert, and this, this actually was the greatest explanation I saw was from um, uh, 
learn new Erlang for, for great good is like excellent. It's really awesome, the explanation for recursion. Pipe operator, kind of minor, but it's, again, the examples, for example, uh, the examples, for example, are so bad. <laughs> examples today that people were using, there was a lot of pipe. If you don't understand what's happening, you're not going to understand the code. You're going to have a hard time, you know? Linked lists, and this is something that I learned a lot when I came to Elixir. Well, I mean, all data structures are important for you to understand, but linked lists are used a lot and, and like how the tail and head works and how you can split them and how you can iterate over them. All those things are really important, really, really important. This has been talked a lot today. Um, Erlang processes to understand that this is not it's not a system process and it's not a thread, that it's like a lightweight thing. How, do, how does that work? And finally, higher order functions. And this one was big for me. Let's, let's spend a little more time on this one because there's a lot of things that I feel like are off the shelf solutions for small problems. And when I, when I was learning Elixir, I, I was doing like, oh, I have a great idea. I'm going to implement this function, which is called on each element of the list, right? And then I realize, oh, wait, this is, this is actually, this is map. Okay. And then, so if you don't know that these things exist, you start reinventing the wheel, yeah? So you start re-implementing things that already exist, and it's super optimized and works well. You're, I'm never going to write a better implementation of that. So... That's, and it starts also to frustrate the person. Like, let's say you're, you're doing this and you have to re-implement map and then suddenly you're losing time. You're not, you're not solving your problem. You're solving something that you didn't know is already solved, right? You can just grab that and use. So, yeah. Bottom line of this is once the people get these fundamental things, they will be able to understand the other things. They will be able to understand the OTP libraries, and um, Erlang itself, you know, gen servers, that kind of thing. And then they will be able to walk on their own. And that's, that's what we want. So, to recap, first of all, we have to not lose them. We have to show them that it's not only concurrency, there's, Elixir is good for other things. Productivity is one that I like. After they start, they usually plummet down, and we have to help them just stand along, right? We have to get them through that. And once that happens, they need to learn the core skills so that they can, let, they can walk on their own. Thank you. I usually tend to believe that a senior software engineer need to be able to teach, right? So you cannot be called a senior engineer unless you are able to teach the people. So he called it a non-technical talk, but I believe that this is a very important core technical talk, right? Do we have any questions on the talk? Any comments, feedback? Uh, do you have any experience as well teaching uh, it to non-developers? No. <laughs> <laughs> that would be great, though. I'd love that. No, uh, but I, I think Elixir is, a, is an appropriate language for a first language. I, I know people disagree with this, but I, I just feel like it's, it's like it's easy to install and it's not super complex to get started on the basics. And you have also IEX, which I really like. When you're learning and you have no idea what's happening, you just, okay, one plus one, it's two. I get it. I, I, okay, that's fine. So you can start very, very, very little. But no, fortunately not. Uh, do, you, do you give any uh, questions regarding uh, intermediate learning? Because that's where I am at the stage. I got to kind of right. down and I started with Pascal and I'm like, yes, I'm ready to go. But I don't necessarily have the greatest desire to you know, build, write a different thing. I'm more actually intrigued by problem solving. You know that Bob, at, when we were in fourth, fifth grade, and learning, you know, so math and some basic algebra, and at the end, after all the basic, um, you know, standard problems that we had, they had like these paragraph 
faith um, questions. And he had to solve, like, hey, if that tree is going to fall down and the wind's going at this speed, and I'm like, okay, I can kind of visualize this. And that was, for me at least, some of the more interesting stuff because I really had to flex my brain and not just like do this standard operation like go oh, here and there. Yeah. And I think that's where I would love to be able to find some more uh, material so I can advance. And I was curious maybe if you would uh, if you experienced other people having similar types of uh, questions, how do they advance when they're at the intermediate stage yeah. and progress to something like that? Yeah. Other than then finding you know, a, uh, a low-level job at a, at a company <laughs> where, you know, they might not certainly like the product, but they need the product. It doesn't have to be low-level, come on. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's, I, I think, um, like, people learn differently, right? I, I personally don't like doing those things, but I know people who do. And for that, I think there are means online for you to do so. For, I think, for example, Code Wars now support Elixir, and they have mentors, so you can actually put your code there and people are going to say, oh, this is not good, right? Or, or like you could have done this better. So I think, I think that's great. And it's kind of to what you're saying, like it's that there's certain problems that you need to solve and it's not really, so you're not really building something, you're, you're like exercising. And then there's more abstract things like project uh, Euler, Euler, can't say that right, which you have just standard problems and you can solve in any language and then you progress through that. Yeah, I started on larger opportunities when we're considering any of the advanced features of Elixir and, Erl uh, and Erlang is the, uh, is the theme. You know? right. And how to try and architect your application in such a way, especially now given contexts and umbrellas and so on, where do we start teaching people how to architect applications instead of just looking at directory structures and say, okay, this is where this goes, this is where that goes. And yeah, I mean, I think there's room for tutorials, like for example, my, my, in my YouTube channel, I, that's something I could do and there's not a lot of videos on, but yeah, right now, it's not much. Yeah, so it's lunchtime. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.